Hello, everyone. I am Daisy Huang, Senior Vice President of Sales and Customer Success at Catalan. Hi, everybody. My name is Angeline Gavino, and I'm the Vice President of Customer Success at Catalan. Welcome to the Women in Test podcast, your go-to space for celebrating the remarkable achievements, stories, and insights of extraordinary women in the ever-evolving world of technology. Each episode is a journey into the lives of these amazing women where we uncover the stories, triumphs, and wisdom they've gained along their unique path. So buckle up for an intimate conversation as we delve into the incredible stories of our outstanding guests. Hi, everybody. Thanks for listening in. My name is Angeline, and I'm one of the hosts of Catalan's Woman in Tax podcast. And today I'm joined by Hema Latamurgisan, or Hema for short. Hi, Hema. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited to be speaking with you and even more excited for, for the topic we're going to talk about, which is how to see challenges as opportunities. And I feel like there's no one more suited to talk about this topic than somebody with over 27 years of experience in the field, a woman leader, and also a thought leader like yourself. Welcome to the podcast, Hema. Thank you, Nancy. It's so nice to see you. Uh, first of all, wishing all of the listeners a very happy new year and that this year, year of joy, abundance of peace, happiness for each one of us. Uh, just to let you know, Angeline, today is a very big festival day in India, 15th Chan. It's a harvest festival and we offer our gratitude to Sun God. You know, without him, all of us are non-existent. Uh, and thanks to Catalon uh, for hosting me on this broadcast and it's lovely to be on this uh, show. How very timely, but thank you so much for taking the time of your holidays to, you know, join us today. We're, we're really super excited about this. And I think it's also a topic that would resonate not just for, you know, tech leaders or people in the tech space, but it really just goes beyond, you know, professional uh, experience, but it's something that you can apply in your personal life as well. You know, seeing challenges is an opportunity. Um, but to kick things off, I would like to get to know you a little bit more, let the audience get to know you a little bit more. So perhaps let's start by you sharing your journey and the tech industry and how you transitioned into a leadership role. Thanks, Anthony. You know, um, I, as you rightly mentioned, I have over, over 26, 27 years of experience, all in specialized testing. Uh, Rich, I would say, in, in, in experience in IT industry. Uh, currently, I'm work, working with HI Mindry as, as the global head of automation performance game testing, you know, and other service lines, as well as the heading the alliance relationships. Um, prior to that, I was with Infosys for over seven, close to 17 years, heading there, you know, various things. And then Astrol, I was there as well, uh, perform, global performance testing head you know, and resilience out there. Uh, during that period, I have almost implemented 14 uh, new service lines. We could be in terms of performance, resilience, reliability, infrastructure, test data management, chain service specialization, and so on, many of those things. So in this course of time, I also have the, you know, uh, experience of developing multiple solutions, frameworks, and, you know, publishing books, thought leadership, conferences, being in the review committee, uh, and so on and so forth, closely working with the Fortune 500 clients traveling across the globe, you know, talking to the, you know, the heads of the accounts and stuff like that. Um, I've also been, um, you know, awarded multiple boards internationally as well as in, in the respective organizations, um, you know, um, from the companies that I've worked for. Um, I'm based out of Bangalore. Um, you know, um, the Silicon Valley of India is what I would say. Uh, so that's about, that's what it is now. And understanding what the client's problems are and trying to address their challenges. And in this two and a half plus decades, I've gone through lots of ups and downs, right? Um, starting from the technology change of be using a, you know, five inch floppy, flimsy big disc, okay, I don't know, today it's not even in the museum I see, and I think today's kids may not even know what it's all about. Uh, four trunk cards and, you know, uh, two valuable 
point five GB. It was so precious, okay, very very precious hard disk drives, big monitors, mainframe application to client server technology drives, static web pages there, Nightscape was there, IE was there, AOL was there. Today, it's, many of them are not even there. Y2K, then internet, cloud, smart devices, no explosion of all over, you know, anything and everything available at your, you know, what your fingertips, right? Uh, so through this journey and experience, um, I'm only reminded of tough times never last, but tough people do, right? I say for the reason as every time technology change and sometimes complex tectonic shift and what we are doing, people who embrace change and learn and learn to adapt survival, and those who fear of losing what they know got left behind, right? And we are in a big, extremely fast paced, fast paced, uh, you know, um, industry. And this fear of embracing change uh, is something all of us, you know, fear, have, including myself, and one has to take care of calculated risks to ensure that we are with the flow, right? I have always been curious to know, you know how technology is changing, its impact on the business, uh, and what the end customers are demanding. With this insight, I was able to kind of incorporate over 17 new testings, service lines, all in testing, testing during my experience over the various companies that I've worked for. And I say it with great pride. Um, and also being in an intellectual industry, we have to constantly upskill, right? Ourselves to stay relevant. Uh, and I've been constantly upskilling not only on technology, but also on the managerial soft skills and many other areas. Also, I think I was one of quite lucky to have worked with some of the industry stalwarts and leaders in the in the industry across the globe that gave a preview of their thought process of how they attack the challenges and how they, you know, convert them into opportunities, how they interact with their clients and, you know, the end customers and stuff like that, right? And this also happens because I had a very knack for I for details, you know, and within 18, uh, 12 to 18 months of me starting my career, I was able to start leading as a functional lead and, you know, tech lead and stuff like that. So that way, give a priority. But also comes with a lot of responsibility. You know, designation is one thing, but comes with accountability and responsibility. Once you start delivering that, then obviously the organization gives you more and more responsibilities, I would say. So this helped me to constantly understand, you know, the expectations of what the clients are looking for, org management, as well as from the team's perspective. So you, you know, we are in a, in a uh, intellectual industry, so it, we are all people dependent, right? At the end of the day, you close the organization, people are not there, not, you don't, you can't deliver, it's not managing me, kind of stuff. And having worked across different types of clients and yogurts, I had the opportunity to learn through kind of various leaders, like I said, uh, and through various economic downturns and through various, it was economic cycles, be it Y2K, be it dot com bars, be it recession, multiple recessions. Um, and now COVID, I mean, pandemic, it just brought everything, you know, nothing worked, right? We had to go through a different kind of set of pro, uh, ways of working it, right? And added to that, you also, I have also personally invested it myself in to enhance my leadership skills by signing up to various courses from leading management schools, you know, reach out to them, participate in the courses, read a lot of books, periodicals, publish papers, conferences, and many other things, helps to understand their views and see how we can incorporate it. Right? And as I speak, I'm also uh, undergoing a weekend management course from a leading you know, uh, management school as well. So in a, in a nutshell, I think it, every on, there is a challenge and every challenge throws up an opportunity for us to utilize and it's up to an individual how you kind of make use of it and when there's a will, there is a way. I love it. I, I want to take a step back and just marvel at 27, 26, 27 years of experience for probably a lot of the people listening right now. This is this is a lifetime for them. This is their lifetime and I think like the, the wealth 
of experience that you've accumulated over the years really shows. And, and I like what you said, where, you know, people who embrace change will survive. One should not fear the change. And instead, you know, things will come, you know, technology has changed over time, economic downturns will, will come. There's just that ebb and flow and ups and downs that happens, you know, throughout the, you know, really every stage of our lives. And I think what determines who survives that are those that are willing to bend through all the changes and adapt to the changes. And there was one thing that resonated with me a lot with what you said, you know, personally investing in oneself, you know, investing in learning, being proactive to to really learn, right? I think that is super important, a very important part of embracing change and seeing opportunity in, in changes and challenges. I, I want to understand, actually, was there a very specific um, challenge that you've um, had to overcome, especially because, you know, this is 27 years of, of career coming from, let's say, an individual contributor and then jumping into a leadership role. Do you feel like there are inherent challenges that goes with that transition? And what, what was the experience for you in that regard? Well, it's amazing, I would say. One thing, you know, the, um, those experiences actually chisel you much better, right? To go through, it's like, you know, um, baptism in fire. So when you go through those challenges and uh, and and go and pick up those un opportunities, convert them into solutions or, you know, address the client challenges, you actually feel a sense of joy at the end of the day, right? Uh, and sometimes not be fully, but at least you making an attempt itself is a big thing. Many of them think, okay, somebody else is born. There is a tech team sitting there. There is a... I would say a COE sitting team there, there's an ideation city. No, at the end of the day, we are very close to the ground. We are the people who are talking to the client. We are the people who are managing the projects. We are, you know, so that that way you are, you know, actually I would feel very, very satisfactory when I look back, you know, what I have done. And also we are in an industry which cuts off because IT industry, that's across all verticals, all geographies, all kinds of clients, be it big, small, you know, banking, retail, whatever, you know, manufacturing, everything. And since we are in that and you tend to meet a lot of, you know, C-level clients and, you know, different project managers and all those kind of things, you get to hear our uh, clients' problems as well as what the particular industry is, you know, kind of uh, working on. And with, uh, now AI, so everybody is jumping in without even realizing how it can be used, what is it, what is the dependencies on stuff like that. So that way it helps me to understand uh, and clients and their end customers as well. Because at the end of the day, our clients are also servicing certain set of clients, right? And uh, I think, so there was something which I know about 10, 12 years back, I would say, when there was a lot of regulation that came up on with respect to the data usage and, you know, how it can be done, especially using the PIIs and, you know, HIPAA and all those kind of stuff. I immediately sense there was something that we can do about it because we used to take a lot of test data and test it and then I there has to be compliance around that. So what I did, I created a service line called test data, test data management, which was very, very well received. And it's not something that it was a cakewalk for me. You have to really do a lot of uh, reading, understand those, um, you know, um, ads and how it can be done and all those kind of stuff. And similarly, about 12, 13 years back, one of our clients, insurance clients, actually saw details to test the applications when they're migrating from, you know, uh, go, um, to another environment, both the application as well as the underlying infrastructure to be tested. And this was something where, you know, typically as an application, you, you being a tester, you know, heading the testing team, you're always concentrating on the application side, not on the underlying, you know, uh, infrastructure kind of stuff. So this gave us an opportunity because it was the cusp of the infrastructure team as well as the application testing team. So. Again, I, I take great pride because uh, having interacted and, you know, uh, formed a con uh, team where we can build across how we can test it on, we came up with this uh, infrastructure team uh, and launched it. And this was, and again, uh, I pioneered this uh, along with the team and it was a, a roaring success, I would say, uh, 12, 13 years back I don't, I'm kind of stuff. And uh, recently, if you see, there are, everything is gamification, right? Uh, be it learning, be it 
now your dress or whatever it is everything is on gamification again you this is a challenge how do we test it right how do end users make uh, get uh, you know uh, experience of what they what the developers intend to what the business users intend to so again i formed a team uh, in the last couple of months and came up with this um, game testing uh, offering right now what is hot well everybody is talking about climate change everybody is talking about you know uh, change in environment and uh, all this kind of stuff so we are working on um, and working on a core offering called a green qa which is um, how how as b testers can help you know address the esg goals sustainability part of it because we are also a big consumer of um, you know the tech and we are also the, the everything lot of carbon footprint and stuff like that so we have just pioneered uh, and part of it have implemented it more as a performance testing team and came up with you know um, without compromise on the performance at least how to come up, how do we reduce the carbon footprint emission and how do we how much trees can be saved and something like that so this is another offering that i've just launched and it's still you know i would say in its maturity then the other thing as is and there could be point solutions that we talk to the client come up with the solutions how you know and it's all team work at the end of the day but the thought process we given we have to mentor them otherwise it just doesn't sound right um as we see a lot of broad challenge and it could be very specific to the client or it could be cutting across kind of stuff again uh people just get enamored saying that oh god this is all and it's all over the world they sometimes just fiddle the thumb but break it down you know compromise takes small steps you will be able to reach that may not be not be able to land at the moon but somewhere you land right that's right i i think there's a, a similar saying that i've heard of if you shoot for the moon or something like that if you shoot for the stars oh man i i it was something like that oh man i have to remember what that <laughs> what that code is but i i marvel at listening at all the initiatives and projects that that you worked on and that you launched and one thing that um you know brings a realization to me is that those who embrace change and challenges pioneers innovation because a lot of the things that you've been working on was a result of you know coming across a challenge and trying to find solutions to resolve and overcome that challenge and i think that's you know a uh, a very powerful way to you know move across your goals and and i like how you said as well how important it is for you to um understand your customers and also understand your team and in coming up with the solutions that you know you've come up over the years and so let's let's talk a little bit about you as a leader and i think you know um this is really one of the reasons why we wanted your perspective on this how, how do you approach challenges in tech leadership and how can they be viewed as as opportunities it's well um, i don't have the bubble to answer for that right and that one thing i want to tell you is all about getting that mindset for the team to understand you know um that they whatever they're trying to do it is for that it's not just for yourself or for the organization but for a larger ecosystem and the world um often times people do not realize that what they're working has a significant impact on the larger uh, ecosystem and tech leadership you know is all about bringing in the the perspective of customers challenges uh from and working through the various different teams it could be our customers customers and customers your customer themselves the business firms uh the legal and compliance teams you know they also have to pitch in depending on what we are working on the architects you know developers and so on and um, often we we miss even the technical writers and somebody who writes the uh, you know help documentation as well right so we have to take them also into consideration to see how our challenges can be done so when we look around and when we interact with multiple clients um you know various stakeholders we get to hear about their pain points and how it is impacting them their day to day work their business goals uh, and customers problems and stuff like that um so having worked through that 
uh, identify those some of those challenges that we are fa- facing. Like for example, I talked about green today. Today, you know, everybody is talking about carbon reduction. How do we optimize it? And uh, we we realize somebody sitting there in the corporate team, the facilities, or the housekeeping, or the people who have to work on that. But actually, we we also, as I said, are guzzlers of huge amount of um, this one, right? Energy consumption. So now when we start digging into deep and tell them this is going to, going to help in the larger uh, ecosystem and the larger impact, then the, depending on the magnitude of the challenge identified, we brainstorm or you know, come up with design thinking workshops, um, you know, conductor, so that the team is made aware of the challenge that is being faced, you know, so that they also understand the growth points and they also understand the contribution by that attitude to, uh, you know, to think differently, think, you know, out of the box kind of stuff. And that becomes a lot more easier and it has to be a constant evolving kind of thing. It's not like overnight it happened. It has a constant thing. And people also have to understand that um, they also have to invest a lot of their personal time because you have to read it apart from your regular work. You also have to go outside and read, learn, contribute and all this kind of stuff. And but now with AI, there's even more need for us to learn more and be more creative. So your ultimately it's a growth mindset, I would say, that that needed us for tech challenge to convert challenges into opportunities. And uh, you know, it's the way you see it, it's either the half glass full or half glass empty. Right. And so so what I'm getting from what you said here, right, is that in order to also get by into the solutions to challenges, you need to involve the key stakeholders in the process of, of solving it and getting them an understanding, a different perspective of, you know, the challenge as well as um, finding ways to solve it together. Yep. And and it's I think it's a good segue to my next question here, right? Because as throughout the conversation we've had so far and I can see that leadership, good le- leadership is obviously very important in, you know, traversing this, you know, turning challenges into opportunities. But you, um, you've talked a lot about how you involve your team and how you also look at the customer perspective. So in the concept of a growth mindset, how, how do you develop and encourage a growth mindset within your team, right? Because it's not enough for you to have that mindset by yourself. It needs to be a collaborative effort, especially if it involves, you know, solving a big challenge. And so how have you done it in the past? How did you cultivate that growth mindset with your team members as well? Okay. Uh, so the way I look at it um, uh, is that I start identifying people and their different skill set, what they're interested in the you know, uh, and see, um, understand their strengths, their core strengths that they need. You can't just give some challenges which they are not even interested to work on, right? And sometimes by trial and error, uh, they have a start. So your close team members, your, you know, and you, and you start talking about this ideation, you start talking about, can we look at this? And, and it's not like you completely delegate. You form teams. You have regular calls. You regular brainstorming sessions with them, uh, workshops with them, and see how this can relate uh, kind of a start. And you mentor them and coach them, and you also give them pointers where to go look for what information. Probably it could be a website. It could be a journal. It could be some you know publication. I know many of those kind of stuff. And then. Ask them to present, you know, in a in a closer network so that their confidence is also built in. So at the end of the day, any of these things which is still very raw, you need to build that confidence. You need to have faith in the team members that, you know, you can do something and rather it. It could be however stupid itself. But the moment they make an attempt, that is a big step. I would say 90% done because they their attitude to, you know, take up challenge and drive it and that growth mindset is getting cultivated. I have also faced multiple challenges where, you know, initially the team members say, I want to take it up, but the moment it gives a challenge, they just buckle and run away, right? Or they come up with all kinds of excuses. And we have seen uh, in this in multiple instances, but there are instances where there are, uh, you know, the team members or the engineers, the architects are willing to take it up despite whatever challenges 
And that's a very great attitude. And they have people really go wrong with creating different uh, solutions for the clients. So I've seen both the things. But at the end of the day, uh, the way I look at it is, you know, don't give one or two. I and mean, give in different dimensions, you know, of challenges to them and see how they take and convert it an opportunity. If they're constantly ignoring it or they just fail about it, then maybe they're not for it. They're just a doer. You know, they just follow instructions. But there are people, you know, who wants to do something differently, identify them, groom them, and then it becomes a lot more easier for us to, you know, identify those opportunities, throw those challenges into them and make it do big. Right. And I think this is going to be very uh, you know, significant or very important for the viewers to understand, right? You know, as, as a leader, how do you, uh, embed that mindset into your team. And I want to break down what you said. So number one, it really starts by understanding your team's interests and their core strengths and really leveraging what they're good at and what they love doing. And then involve them early on when it's the process of coming up with a solution. So start ideating with them and do great storming sessions with them, collaborate with them, and then also give them a space and a platform to present the solution themselves so that you know they really are part of that whole journey and the whole cycle of you know, identifying the challenge and then trying to figure out how to solve that challenge. And, and I, I really like that, uh, you know, like cultivating your team's strengths and, and their interests as well. Um, I, I want to do a flip side of that, actually. How, how do you address their their weakness or their weaknesses or the 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 points that they're not very strong at to still cultivate that, that growth mindset in them? Um very tough question, right? Okay, we are in a path based and today's generation, I would say, uh, especially people born post 2000 um they're always on their uh internet uh you know mobile whatsapp social media kind of stuff so bringing this mindset for them of thinking larger thing is very difficult actually and it is not just me i think many of the leaders are facing this you know uh, uh, on this particular stuff because they spend more time uh you know on the social media than on you know trying to learn kind of a stuff so bringing this growth media uh, mindset, uh, I don't have a well, no, straightforward answer for them. But yes, what the way I look at it is um, involve them, you know, involving them, sit with them, work through them. Uh, I know we are still in that hybrid mode of working from, you know, all this from home and all those things. But I try and see that, you know, at least they come regularly to office and are all over Teams call and making them think, or I, I kind of uh, have some sessions like um, high tea with Hema and groom the, uh, tell them what we have done in something and showcase those kind of stuff. So, so those kind of stuff that I have done. But, uh, you know, uh, the way I look at it is give them small, small um, modules for them to crack it. They, then it's like, you know, they, they feel joy in doing it. And then, you know, then you keep raising the bar then it becomes a little more easier. And sometimes they just fizzle out. Um, uh, you know, and I also, uh, I personally feel like constantly keep my, uh, I mean, I tell them, keep your antenna up, and I, including myself. Um, picking up the various signals, in for meeting the relevant stakeholders, what's happening in the street, the different journals, different messages that come across, uh, and evaluating the inputs. I deal with the required stakeholders and, some, when you start involving these team members, they really feel joy that their contribution is also taken into account, right? Um, but when when you take them account, you also tell them why if they have, it is not right. You also explain why it is not right. Then they, it, uh, uh, I would say um, they're not great to them, right? You sure it, they generally they carry each of us carry a string long way kind of a stuff. So. That way, you will not enforce uh, them to, uh, you know, say not go wrong, but fail fast is what I would say mm-hmm. to them. So uh, sometimes mistakes are a learning uh, experience, uh, Angela, and I have done through gone through a lot of such things. So when I look back, uh, 
maybe 15, 20 years back, I would have been very anxiety what I, I did do this, right? But today I look, because I made the accident, I'm able to correct, make ensure that I'm correct next time I'm doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I remember you saying earlier as well, right? Usually you you embody the leaders that you've worked with, right? And you mentioned earlier on that you were lucky to have worked with, you know, leaders yeah. uh, and see firsthand how they embrace challenge and, and changes as well. And I think being a um, a good example for the team is is a good starting point. But it, it also very you're very practical and saying, you know, there's a generational difference as well that comes into play. Like, and I do see that a lot within my teams as well. You know, the the younger generations. Um, have a different mindset. Um, not that they want to, they're not, they don't have the growth mindset. It's just there's a different approach for them to yeah. to get into into the mindset. Like you said, you know, they're they're so used to like having everything instant or you know being exposed to social media, and so that learning aspect, you know, typically kind of takes a back seat. Like you said. Um, but but one thing I also took note about what you said earlier is that you work with them very closely and and you mentor them as well um, as part of you know helping them into that develop that growth mindset. Yeah, yeah, and and still you know diving deep into the synergy of of a leader working with you know team members, their team members, right? How do you? navigate challenges within your your tech team and what advice do you have for fostering a positive team culture right so it goes beyond now uh with you working with them as a team member but as a team how do you th develop that um positive team culture but also that growth mindset uh, culture of growth mindset okay an interesting question because um at the end of the day, the success or uh, anything is boiled down to the culture, right? You might be a successful company, but if the culture is not right, you know, then you have uh, issues. And we have seen this lot of books that, that has been uh, talked about, you know, our company reaches the best award and two years later, they're non-existent. So it all boils down to the culture, right? So we are in a in, in an ever-changing technology in the landscape, right? And I myself, as I said, having gone through a lot of ups, uphills, both economic side and the change of technology, um, learning is the way. You know, if you uh, you have to continue to be learned, and if one wants to continue the career in this particular industry, the IT industry, um, as much as you learn, you also have to unlearn it you all know, to enhance your potential, right? It's like, you know, you can't keep stuffing in your fridge until you remove the whole stuff and throw it, which is and discard right, right? Something which you're not going to use beyond certain time. Just make it for it. You clean up, you know, uh, your hard disk, you know, a lot of old files. If you're not using it, just pack it up or delete it. So that's the way. And similarly, unlearning is actually equally important, you know, as much as, and sometimes we would say, uh, embracing change is right, but what? change to embrace is also equally important, I would say, right? So like I said, I closely work with them, understand and where they want to be in the 12 to 18 months. That's very important, right? Otherwise, if they are not aligned to where they, they, they can get part, they have, to, they have dreamt about, it's not going to happen. And this in term, they, I ask them whether they have connected to their next layers kind of stuff, right? So that way you are able to kind of, you know, this, your sphere of influence for each team members to their team members increases that for you build that culture. I think it's not like, you know, something sitting in a ivory castle and nothing gets done. You have to, you know, ensure that it goes to the grassroots level, like the way the tree, you know, kind of things. Under the roots are strong, the, the shoot is going to be strong. Otherwise, you know, any any heavy winds, you're, you're just gone. So, and you have to guide, mentor them how they do it and how to communicate, what not to communicate so that there is a um, element of interest in their element of curiosities and their element of success in, in, in that kind of stuff. So therefore, you know, the way the culture responds, I'm going to constantly engage them, talk to them, uh, give them the ideas that has already been converted into, you know, I would say solutions and how it has been taken forward. So that gives them the things. 
give them the platform, you know, to, for publication. It could be a small blog, it could be a small paper publication, it could be whatever it is that gives them that kind of uh, ease kind of things. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes as we said, assign them, they don't succeed. Assign a different one, they don't succeed. Uh, but over a period of time, they get to know the hang of it, that this is something they want to grow up. If they also want to go into the leadership, unless they, do, they want to be a stagnant kind of a thing. Uh, and when we start, you know, uh, challenging this, energizing to the larger team, obviously the culture starts coming up. I did have an initial challenge, especially during the COVID times. Uh, I think all, all um, companies are having, because your social, you know, connect was not there, there, there at all. Uh, so the very notion of converting the challenges into opportunities, identifying services or solutions to the client started coming down. But you had to really work through that and constantly talk to them, give them that kind of a message that this is not something that we can work with. It we we will become absolute and become. If you have to continue to stay relevant, you have to convert these challenges into opportunities and regular reviewers sharing the happenings. And uh, I also think uh, what I also do is I just don't get more from forward. I do a lot of informal interactions. It could be over coffee or over and So therefore, you are, you are actually create, um, you know, breaking the barrier, you know, with, your lead, with the team and they should not look, look as a leader. Maybe I'm a couple of years of years of experience more, but not necessarily that I'm there sitting in that kind of stuff. So uh, there are, I mean, there is no straightforward answer. There are multiple ways that you need to do it. And culture is very, very deep rooted. Uh, it, if you want us to have a strong, positive mindset, having a positive culture in the team is very, very important, actually. Totally agree. Um, and, and I like what you said that uh, really fostering that. Um, positive mindset or positive culture within a team it's really a constant cycle of learning and unlearning certain things as well and uh, it brings me to to one of the things uh, that I learned along the way as well you know throughout my career that how how people usually learn more effectively, especially professionals. It's, there is this 70-20-10 rule where they say that 70% of your learning really comes from you doing doing it, like in practice. And 20% comes from social learning or you learning from others, like you mentioned mentoring, coaching. And then 10% comes from really only 10% comes from like classroom training, you know, online classes, certifications and all of that. And I can see uh, that this is how you also look at how you develop your teams, right? Like you let them do, it's a constant, um, how should I say? It's a constant uh, theme that I've seen in a lot of, you know, the questions that we've gone through, like letting them learn by themselves, letting them do by themselves or, giving them a hands-on experience and then you know you at the same time still mentoring and then coaching them through the motions yeah so how do you think and this is something you mentioned in the beginning that throughout that you know more than a, more than two decades of being in the industry you see how the technology has evolve over time and and going back to that generally generational thing that you mentioned earlier i'm sure like a lot of things that you've seen like 20 ish years ago does not it's very hard for the new newer generation younger generation yeah. to resonate with and how do you how do you feel technology trends play a role in turning challenges into opportunities especially for you as a tech leader oh um an interesting question because the uh, Technology has saved today's life everywhere. Be it starting from the milkman to the you know uh, the scientists to everybody, right? Without that, we are not able to breathe today. I think if you see, actually, the challenges only have made the technology take it up as opportunities on you know finding solutions to see. Um, it's due to this very use of technology, I would say, that the end user problems are quickly identified. You know, right? Um, what the end user are facing, it could be in the remote areas, 
right? The leaders and technology adapters are now adopting technology to address these challenges. Uh, for example, earlier we had challenges due to poaching in the forest, right? That forest department were having tough time to protect nature, you know, uh, the killing of wildlife and so on. There. But with the advent of drones, which is a technology game changer for us, right? We are now able to quickly understand, do the surveillance and take necessary action. It could be a forest fire, it could be a poaching, it could be whatever is the issue. Right, so techno we have adapted technology and it's over a chain. Same is the case with earthquakes, cyclones, tsunami. Earlier, due to the use of technology, you know, we are now able to uh, address these mammoth challenges um, to minimize the casual, um, casualties to a large extent, which probably in 2004 when tsunami occurred, the casualties were very high. Today, we are not having that kind of, but we are more prepared for it. Again, the use of technology is what I would say. So with different industrial revolutions, you know, uh, coming from Industry 1.0, there was always a fear, oh God, I'm going to lose my job, I'm going to be, there's going to be more automation. But every time we did, there was more work for us uh, um, that is coming our way. With different industrial revolutions, as I said, you know, human race has evolved solving problems, right? So uh, coming closer to the mass, coming, getting, uh, you know, uh, taking... Uh, technology solutions at a much faster space and at a much lesser ready use thought. But the flip side, uh, Angeline, is that while we are creating problems and solving them, we are actually creating new ones like the climate change, carbon emissions, and you know many of those kind of stuff. So in a nutshell, while we try to address the challenges, there we're creating more opportunities. We also need to see that it doesn't have other impact more specifically to our mother earth because that's the only earth we have, right? And uh, this is where leaders and all, collectively all of, you know, tech, not just the tech leaders, we have to work through a lot of other uh, stakeholders in this whole thing, study different dimensions and bring in different perspectives to address the challenges, more these things. So grabbing the challenges and making this offer is one thing, but those opportunities, whether it has a lesser impact or a higher impact for the other larger ecosystem also needs to be policy. And this is something that we are learning through the process, right? It's not something that we learned earlier. And we, earlier we were able to solve the problems and move on. But today those problems can create, you know, is coming up with a, a different set of uh, problems. So we have to look at it. So the buzzword, I, one more thing is AI agenda. Everybody wants it, you know, and just be it, you know, you, there's nobody who's saying no. But the moment they get to know what are the dependencies and what it happens and all the things, what we are realizing is one of the huge guzzlers of um, emitting high carbon, you know, emissions and power consumption and all this. So every technology has its own pros and cons, and that needs to be weighed. And that's exactly where today we are talking about green QA and all those kind of stuff. While we address the challenges, while we address the resolving the problems, climbing solutions and whatnot, is, we also need to see how it is kind of impacting on the ecology, environment stuff, social stuff, technology impact as well. So this is the largest of which probably a couple of years back we missed it. But I think today realization is dawning upon given the kind of changes that we are seeing across the across the low bench. Okay. I want I want to uh, I guess dig deep a little bit into what you say. Does do I hear you saying that technology brings in it more bad than good? Oh uh, I wouldn't say that you have to lay the pros and cons on each technology kind of a stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Uh it's like a knife, right? And knife in a surgeon's hand is much, it's very different from a knife without, you know, somebody else. So it all depends on how you use it. But it's the same technology. You know, if I use the knife as a technology kind of a stuff. A chat uses it very differently. You know, a surgeon uses it very totally different. So that's what, yeah, it all depends on how you use it and what kind of uh, learnings you do it. But uh, unlike earlier, as I said, we were looking at more, you know, focused in a narrow-minded, but today we have to look at it much larger in kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I really, I like that analogy. I think, you know, it drives the point uh, home, right? It's really not that technology is good or bad. It's really just how we make use of, of that technology. 
going back to to the topic at hand, do you feel like technology helps us accelerate that, you know, turning challenge turning challenges into into opportunities? Do you feel like somehow it does help us get to solutions faster? Um, I don't know whether it's the right way or wrong, but every technology uh, will be I come comes up with certain addressing certain solutions. And so that solutions, how it is deployed kind of a stuff. So it is neither fast or uh, wrong about it, but definitely, again, it's a case-to-case business. Like, for example, when the vaccine ha- for uh, COVID ha- pandemic had to come, we had to fast and, you know, kind of thing. Again, technology help, helped us, you know, in uh, dying this. Do we say that it didn't go through process? Maybe yes. Maybe not. I don't know. I I know I'm not assuming that. But there's definitely technology helps us at least to reach things faster, uh, mm-hmm. takes it to a larger masses kind of a stuff. Uh, how do you use it and consumer it is something that leads to that little bit more, I know, uh, watching. I understand. Okay. And and because the name of the podcast is Woman and Tess, I feel like I have to ask the question, especially because we're talking about challenges and turning that into opportunities. And we know that the tech industry is a very male dominated industry. And I wonder, going through your journey as well as a leader in the space, are there specific challenges that you've had to overcome as a woman leader in this space? Um, I mean, it's a question that I often part about. Yes, when I'm uh, going through this, uh, unlike today, uh, there were a lot of challenges, right? Um, uh, in fact, there could be in the uh, room, meeting rooms or boardrooms, you would be the only lady sitting there, you know, there will be all men out there. Uh, sometimes you do feel discomfort, but at the end of the day, what uh, matters is what you're bringing to the table, right? Um, so there has been multiple instances, um, you know, I've traveled alone in late nights and all this kind of stuff, but all in the purpose of ensuring that we address the client, uh, what the client is looking for kind of stuff. Um, yes, today things have changed where there is a lot of um, drive from various quarters that so many persons have to be within leadership and all those kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, leaders uh, be it you know, male or female, whatever it is, uh, what you bring to the table and your attitude to solve the problems and build consensus among the various stakeholders is is what is ne- needed. And this today we are in an ever changing competitive world. The constant, the only constant I stand myself and to all my team members and to whoever I can, you know, talk to, learn to be in the learning mode. That's all I would I, I want to say about it. And that doesn't matter whether you are a male or a female. I mean, you can skies the limit. And also identify interest, you know, be technical or process or wherever it is, and keep in watch on, you know, understanding those trends, changes. So that way it has helped me because I knew what I want to do, where I want to do. Uh, I knew what I know I at least I know what I want to do, but how to go over was definitely, a, you know, in a maze kind of thing because those kind of information is not there and you might want to know whether you might be misguided kind of stuff. So the only way we can sharpen ourselves is with Norway, Jenny, Power, Germany, whatnot names are coming up. It's going, to, it's going to change a lot of dynamics in the industry, right? So you have to uh, do it with a lot of, I mean, enthusiasm and passion. You can't do it just like a job, nine to five job. But if you do it more in a passion and you, you have a goal, then it becomes all the more easy. Uh, just to lend you, Angeline, you know, you you did say that as a woman, I think. Uh, I was probably uh, lucky in a way because uh, I had good leaders, I would say, and very challenging environments, very, very tricky environments. In fact, a couple of years ago, um, you know, I was able to create a solution that helped directly a couple of millions for my leading client because I was working directly with the CIO. And uh, typically, you clients come and say, hey, good job, thank you. But I never expected that that client on a different continent shipped um, 
a cake, beautiful cake with a cherry on the cake to me to my home. And um, and what is even more amazing, Angeline, is that I'm a strict vegetarian and it was an eggless cake to my home. Right? And that beats all the awards that I've received. That beats every single thing. So, which means you actually bring this, your skin in the game for the client. So that's what I would uh, look at it. And today, instills are always, you know, as I said, the fear of missing out, you know, jumping out. But I so I feel that do pause, you know, take a look around, uh, observe and sink in the happening in your end. And suddenly something will click which will help you. Today, we are in a constant rat race, uh, you know, to respond to messages, respond to whatever is happening around you. But the moment you pause, spend some time, observe your thoughts, you know, it's going to give immense joy. And that brings in a lot of clarity during the, through the whole, whole day, is what I would say. And that for whatever challenges, you know, as you said, we mean, yes, I did face, I'm not saying I'm not, uh, I didn't face it. It could be in promotions, it could be in multiple phases, right? But you, at the end of the day, you were happy learning what you were doing is what I felt about it. And to summarize, you know, um, uh, what is um, Apple, this is a very one of my favorite quote, right? Apple, Tim Cook, CEO of Apple. Says in business and then sports, the vast majority of victories are determined before the beginning of the game, right? Uh, because in sports, you have to practice it, not necessarily how you play, you know, that helps you play the field. We rarely control the timing of the opportunities, but we can control our preparedness. Uh, Angeline. So that's the way I look at it. I mean, I'm, I know I, I cherish all the learnings. Yes, there could be a lot of things that I could have done differently, but maybe that time, that's the way it has to be done. I love that. I love that. And like I said as well, like the ability to turn challenges or see challenges as opportunities is is a skill that's not only important in your professional life, but in your personal life. Like that quote you just mentioned, I think, you know, it, you don't have to be a tech leader. You don't have to be working in tech for that to resonate with you. Like um, it resonates with everybody. And and it, and I want to summarize a few points that you said there, right? Like the recipe for having that ability to see challenges and turn them into opportunities is have a growth mindset. Find something that you're passionate about because I guess if you're, because if you are passionate about something, you know, you are willing to do and you're willing to go beyond and be proactive to learn, but then also learn when and how to unlearn certain things yeah. like that. That has been one of some of the things that I've heard from you today. And, and as a final parting point for for individuals aspiring to leadership roles in tech and to the listeners that we have today, what advice do you have for them regarding resilience, continuous learning, and maintaining that proactive mindset? Well, choose your passion. What you want to do, right? Next to an on three deeper, whatever you want to do. I need by your question. Is that going to solve the purpose of your life? Look for that, you know. So um the moment you understand what is the purpose of your life, the moment you understand what your passion, all the drudgery just vanishes. You love doing what you, you're doing. There's no fatigue what you kind of do it, right? So start, when you start doing it, start writing blogs. It could be a small circle. It could be a small um, point of views. It could be white paper. You know, it could be presentation in the conferences. It could be, you know, in your own inter, in, in your, every organization has its own mindset session. Start singing. That way, you will get confident. That way, you will, you will have a morale booster. And somewhere, you will you will actually take the need prop into that, and you will also get connected because you identify your, I would say, um, your core strengths, your core passion, what you want, and you'll start getting into the core. And for some reason, the universe also helps you build, build that connect. I will tell you. I mean, you believe in the universe, right? Observe and think, as is what I would say. So you will land there and spend time journaling every day for 10, 15 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever is the time, about what you want to do, how you want to achieve. And, you know, over a period of time, you will be able to achieve. And the constant learning on a daily basis, that's what I have to do. And have some mentors. It could be may not be within your own uh, organization. It may not be in your own industry, but having mentors from different industries, different 
it's all help you long term because we are in tech industry different perspectives is required Totally agree. I, I love what you said about mentorship as well. And I think, you know, seeking mentorship never stops, even as even when you go up the ranks, even you as a tech leader with 27 years of experience, you I assume that you still, you know, work with with mentors or also maybe in the con on the other side, you you mentor people as well, right? Yeah. Okay. I think that's a great um uh, parting point for us, learn your purpose. Uh, that's, I, I think, one of the key takeaways that I really have and what you said today and resonated with me. Because if you're doing something that you're passionate about, everything else just falls into place and challenges becomes opportunities for you to learn and to grow, right? Yep. Okay. Well, Hema, thank you so much for your time today. It has been great talking about you, learning about your experiences throughout, you know, your whole professional journey. Thank you so much for your time. And I think that's it. We wrap up this session and, you know, we hope to talk to you again soon. I know this isn't your first rodeo. We have worked with you at yeah, Catalan in several webinars and we're always happy to have you. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Catalan. With John Beth and thanks to the listeners for spending your valuable time to tune in. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too.